In this video, I will solve the problem of a classical crystal or an infinite uh, chain of classical oscillators, and I will determine the uh, normal modes in this system. Uh, and as I mentioned, I will do it actually in the chain, which means it's in 1D. And I should mention that um, actually I could have done it in two dimensions or three dimensions. It would have been a little bit more complicated, but otherwise actually the difference, the key features of the solution uh, are pretty much the same uh, in one dimension and uh, higher dimensions apart from some uh, polarization effects. Uh, and uh, for this reason, I will just concentrate on the simpler case of 1D, but we could have done it in any dimension. So the specific model I'm going to consider is presented here. So we'll consider a one dimensional chain. So we should uh, imagine that this uh, is an infinite chain. Actually, more specifically, I will consider so-called periodic boundary conditions for simplicity, but in an infinite system, it doesn't really matter. And so the, in this chain, as you can see, I have two types of atoms. Well, these guys, uh, the uh, brown and red uh, circles, they correspond, uh, well, in my model, to a, an atom of such 1D crystal. And the positions of atoms will be labeled by X sub N for uh, lighter atoms and uh, capital Y sub N for heavier atoms. And the index N here corresponds to, in some sense, to an elementary uh, cell. So here, this elementary cell would be, uh, you know, one lighter atom and one heavier atom. And let's say uh, the size of this elementary cell will be uh, two times the distance between the atoms. And um, so n can be, you know, one, two, three, four, so I have an infinite uh, series of these uh, elementary cells. And also for the sake of simplicity, I will be measuring uh, uh, the distances in the beginning of my solution uh, in uh, the units of this uh, elementary cell size. So I will essentially set 2a uh, equals to 1. So a is basically the uh, equilibrium length of um, uh, spring. And so 2a is uh, essentially uh, represents the symmetry of my discrete symmetry in my problem. So if I translate everything by 2a, I uh, get uh, my crystal. And what I'm saying here is that I'm going to be using the units where 2a is set to 1. But basically, this is my problem. And so let me uh, write down uh, first the energy of this system. And so the energy actually is very simple to write down. So the energy, as usual, will contain the kinetic energy part and the potential energy part. And so the kinetic energy part includes the kinetic energy of uh, all uh, light atoms. So uh, this uh, lighter case P sub n over squared over 2m. And uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the heavy atoms. So which I actually have a color code here. The uh, sort of brownish uh, font correspond to terms that are associated with the lighter atoms. And the red fonts naturally corresponds to terms which are associated with the heavier atoms. And then there will be a potential energy, which is just the usual Hooke's law, if you want. But we, I now have a Hooke's law for every single spring in this, uh, in this uh, oscillator chain. So, for example, in this nth uh, elementary cell, I'm going to have uh, a term here uh, associated with the uh, spring between this lighter atom and this uh, heavier atom. And so this uh, term essentially corresponds to this, uh, this spring. But also there will be an interaction, let's say, of this heavy atom with the lighter atom from the next elementary cell, the nth plus, uh, plus one ele elementary cell. And uh, so there is a term also here uh, uh, in this uh, Hamiltonian, this classical Hamiltonian associated with this nearest neighbor interaction. Now, and of course, I have to sum over all these n's and this will be uh, will give me the total energy of my classical uh, crystal. Now, the next step uh, is to actually, to solve this problem, uh, is to write down the equations of motion for all the particles involved. And there is an infinite number of such particles. And in our case, these equations of motion are nothing but Newton's equations, uh, well, associated with each of these uh, particles. And as usual, well, the Newton equation uh, is uh, m, m times a, my mass times acceleration, is equal to the sum of all the forces. And uh, the force uh, can be found by as a derivative or gradient, in this case it's just one dimensional gradient, of the corresponding um, uh, potential energy with respect to the coordinate of a particle where uh, we're investigating. 
And so, for instance, uh, for the lighter atoms, uh, for the nth lighter atom, this will be the Newton law, and for the uh, nth heavy atom, this will be the Newton law. And so, if we just uh, formally uh, differentiate our potential energy, we get uh, these uh, equations of motion for the uh, lighter atoms and the, low, the heavy atoms. And it's very natural that there are two terms in each uh, of these uh, equations because this essentially corresponds to having two springs attached to each of the atoms. So, for example, here, uh, this equation, we can uh, understand the first term as being associated with the force uh, exerted on this heavy atom by this spring. And the second term is going to be uh, the force uh, uh, exerted on the same atom by this other spring to the right. So, uh, and the goal now is to solve these equations. Of course, it's an infinite chain of equations because n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is an integer index which labels uh, our pairs of heavy and light atoms. So here I'm showing the same uh, Newton's law that we derived in the previous slide, but now uh, just slightly rewritten. So I just grouped together this uh, 2x sub n and 2y sub n. So, of course, uh, it's a very complicated looking system of equations. We actually have an infinite uh, system of coupled uh, differential equations. And, uh, well, naively we would uh, we could just say that it's hopeless. You know, there is no way we can solve such a complicated model. But it turns out that uh, using a combination of uh, a powerful uh, mathematical method, which we already used actually, the Fourier transform, and a, a reasonable physical guess, we can solve the problem in a few relatively straightforward steps. So and the method involves essentially a Fourier transform where we uh, represent our uh, time-dependent coordinates of the light and heavy atoms as a, a linear combination or an integral over a wave vector of a wave-like uh, excitation. So here I have essentially a plane wave in one dimension and so remember that I introduced these uh, units of 2a equals to 1. Therefore, this wave vector multiplies just an integer label n, which labels my um, um, coordinates of my light atoms. And I represent the uh, heavy atoms as a linear combination of their own wave with some new amplitudes, uh, capital Y sub Q. And here I use Q times n plus 1 half because uh, this guy is uh, shifted uh, by one half in my uh, units of length relative to the light atom. And importantly here I have the time dependence uh, again uh, which is consistent with the wave-like behavior. So we assume essentially that whatever solutions there are, this solution represent uh, waves running through this uh, crystal. And now the next step in the solution is to plug in these uh, trial uh, functions into the uh, Newton equations and to see if we can uh, make, a, we can find a self-consistent solution which is consistent both with the Newton equations and uh, with this uh, representation. And going a bit ahead of myself, I would say that, of course, uh, the, the reason I'm presenting this solution is because we will indeed find that it's self-consistent. But the self-consistency will uh, include, in a very essential way, uh, a relation between omega and q, between the frequency uh, of the wave and uh, the uh, wave vector. So, uh, and uh, this, is the dis this is going to be the dispersion of the waves, the possible dispersion of the waves. And uh, basically, to solve the problem in this context means to find uh, this uh, dispersion, basically to find omega as a function of... So now let me consider um, every single term, let's say in the first uh, Newton equation corresponding to the light atoms. So the first term in the left-hand side, uh, the second derivative of the coordinate with respect to time, the acceleration, uh, here is going to involve the integral over all uh, wave vectors. Uh, and I will just label this integral uh, as integral sub q, not to write the differentials. Uh, and here I'm going to have x sub q, and the derivative of this exponential with respect to time is going to produce minus uh, i omega squared, uh, exponential of i q n minus i omega t. So this is just minus uh, omega squared. Now, I also have here this uh, term of y sub n plus y uh, n uh, plus 1, 
which essentially corresponds uh, here in this picture uh, to having this uh, red atom to the left and the red atom to the right. And so if I now calculate uh, this term, y sub n plus uh, y uh, n minus 1, I simply can write this expression. So I have an integral sub q, capital Y sub q. And here I have a sum of two terms, e to the power i q uh, n plus 1 half, plus e to the power i q uh, n uh, minus 1 half, because now this corresponds to n minus 1, e to the power minus i omega t. Or uh, I can factor out this e to the power i q n, and here I will have e to the power i q over 2 plus e to the power minus uh, i q over 2. And this is equal to the cosine, proportional to the cosine. So I can write it identically uh, as an integral over q y sub q uh, twice cosine of q over 2, multiplying the same exponential as uh, in this term here. And if I put everything uh, together, so what I'm going to get is, uh, and basically if I focus only on the coefficients which multiply the same plane waves uh, in each of these integrals, I can write uh, the essentially the same Newton law, but now in the Fourier space, as uh, minus m uh, omega squared uh, x sub q from this guy is equal uh, to k uh, twice uh, y sub q cosine q over 2, this term, which we just derived, uh, minus uh, 2 uh, x sub q. And this is uh, essentially uh, the uh, Newton law corresponding to uh, the light atoms written in the free space. Of course, we can um, repeat the same uh, kind of procedure for the second uh, Newton law for the heavy atoms. And if we do so, uh, we are going to get the following system of equations. So the first one we just derived and the second one I didn't explicitly derive, but it's uh, derived in a very similar uh, fashion. So, uh, and uh, well, the good thing about these equations, uh, first of all, that uh, instead of an infinite chain of coupled equations, I actually just have two coupled equations, okay? You see that, uh, of course, I have all different Qs involved, so I can change my Q, but there is no coupling between different Qs, unlike in real space where we did have coupling between neighboring uh, sides, N. And another thing which is good is that it's no longer a differential equation. Instead of the derivative, I now have um, uh, just uh, omega squared here. So, uh, it's much easier now to deal with this uh, essentially linear 2x2 uh, two two, uh, system of equations. And uh, to solve the remaining part, let me just rewrite the same equation in a slightly different form. I will write it as a matrix. Well, it's the same equation I just had before, but now I wrote it in a slightly different way. I wrote it as a matrix, 2x2 two two matrix, acting on a vector if you want which contains uh, the Fourier component of the coordinate of the light atoms and the Fourier component of the coordinates of the heavy atoms. And uh, the right-hand side is zero, because if we go back, we see that all the terms here are proportional to one or the other coordinate. There is no free terms here, which is just constants. So uh, I can write it like that, and it's equal to zero. And maybe most of you or some of you know from uh, linear algebra, that in order for me to be able to have a non-trivial solution to this equation, which is not identically equal to zero, well, basically a solution where x and uh, q are not identically equal to zero, I have to ensure that the determinant of this matrix, so the determinant of this matrix, uh, vanishes. And, uh, well, uh, this is the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix, which I can calculate. And, uh, well, if you do so, you will get um, the following equation which is the uh, algebraic equation, and essentially it reduces to a quadratic equation. Well, it's, formally it's an equation of the fourth order, but there is only omega squared involved, so all, uh, all in all it's just a quadratic equation that uh, I hope uh, most of you know how to deal with. And, uh, well, what is this equation for? Okay, this is again an equation for the frequency or more precisely for the uh, dependence of the frequency on the wave vector, which is known as a dispersion relation. So, uh, well, we have seen actually many dispersion relations already in this course in the context of quantum physics and also, also classical physics. For instance, when we talk about uh, the energy of a particle, of a free particle, 
being proportional to uh, uh, p squared. So this is essentially a dispersion relation, let's say, of an electron or any other free particle. When we talk about the dispersion relation of a photon, where omega scales uh, linearly with the wave vector, this is, well, uh, the dispersion relation of electromagnetic waves. So now we have here uh, an equation which determines the dispersion relation of elastic waves, otherwise known as uh, photons, which can exist in this uh, sort of simple model of, uh, of a one-dimensional uh, crystal. So now, before solving this equation, let me go back to the uh, sort of physical, uh, original physical units where the dimension of length is restored. So here we have this Q, the wave vector, which is measured in one over distance. And remember that my um, sort of convention was that uh, 2A, uh, A being basically the size of the, the length of a spring, was equal to 1. So if we want to restore the right physical dimension, dimension I, I should multiply this Q here by 2A. And also, of course, uh, 1 minus cosine squared is equal uh, to sine squared. So I can just rewrite in the uh, usual physical units. I, I can write this term as sine squared uh, Q times A. And now, uh, well, again, this is just the um, quadratic equation, uh, omega for omega. So if I solve it, uh, I will get two branches uh, uh, with a plus and minus sign. And uh, well, I get a, actually a rather nonlinear and non-trivial relation between uh, omega and Q. There are two relations as a matter of two types of excitations, so two types of waves or normal moves that I get out of this uh, solution. So if I plot these uh, dispersion relations, so this would be my uh, omega of Q, and Q here is defined, I should have mentioned it before, between min minus pi over A up to uh, pi over A. So we'll get uh, two terms. There will be um, a branch corresponding to plus sign, the plus branch, which will look like this. And there will be a branch corresponding to minus sign, which will look uh, approximately as so. So this is omega minus and this is omega plus. And uh, the omega minus uh, is called uh, acoustic phonons, and uh, the omega plus is called uh, optical phonons. So, uh, the, as you can see, uh, there is a gap separating these optical phonons from zero energy. So, if we hit uh, our, uh, our oscillator chain with a hammer, uh, and it's going to be a nonlinear perturbation. We're going to excite all kinds of moves. But if we just touch it very slightly, very gently, and uh, apply just a weak perturbation, there is no way we can excite uh, an optical phonon. We're only going to excite uh, these energy excitations uh, in the vicinity of uh, zero energy. So this is uh, basically the energy, associated energy, uh, that we, we need to spend in order to excite, uh, in this case, acoustic moves. And the dispersion of these acoustic moves as Q goes to zero, we'll uh, also discuss it in the next slide, is actually linear dispersion. And this type of linear dispersion is called uh, sound, okay? A sound-like dispersion. And the coefficient of proportionality, basically, omega uh, as a function of Q in the Q to zero limit for these acoustic phonons, uh, this coefficient of proportionality is uh, the speed of sound. I actually forgot to mention a couple of things here. So in this equation, there appears this uh, variable mu. So mu here is simply the reduced mass, which we actually have seen uh, before quite a few times, which is uh, in this case, the product of the ma mass of uh, uh, light atoms and heavy atoms and divided by their sum. And the last thing I'm gonna mention on this slide is uh, something about the optical phonons. Namely, that the existence of this optical branch is related to the fact that we have two, type, uh, two types of atoms present in our uh, crystal. So if we had just one type of atom, let's say these blue atoms were uh, the only type of atoms, then we would not have had the optical branch and we only would have had the uh, acoustic branch. Which, by the way, the acoustic branch corresponds uh, to what I was discussing in the end of the previous lecture, to the presence of this sort of broken symmetry in the crystal. 
So finally, let me calculate uh, the speed of sound, that is the coefficient of proportionality in this uh, dispersion of the acoustic wave uh, as Q goes to zero. So uh, as we can see here, uh, so if we uh, just uh, focus on uh, the um, minus sign in this equation, okay? So, uh, and uh, if we consider the limit of uh, Q uh, very small, then this guy uh, can be expanded in Taylor series just up to first order, so we're just gonna have Q A uh, squared instead of the sign. And also, uh, well, this whole thing, the square root uh, of one minus this uh, four mu squared uh, over M, uh, capital M, uh, Q A squared, in the limit of uh, small Q, it can be uh, written, again, using the Taylor series, so if we have one minus epsilon and epsilon is small, we can approximately write it as one minus epsilon over two. So in this case, epsilon is this whole thing, and it's indeed small because we're near the zero momentum and zero energy. So we can write it approximately as one minus uh, two mu squared uh, mm q a squared. So if we plug it back in here, so we're gonna see that one minus one gives us zero, and we have just this guy appearing. So the uh, uh, spectrum of the uh, acoustic phonons in the Q to zero limit is approximately equal to K over mu uh, to uh, mu squared uh, M uh, M Q A squared. Or we can cancel these guys and we're gonna have uh, simply recalling the definition of the reduced mass two times the stiffness divided by the sum of uh, two masses q a squared or if we take finally the square root of this expression we're going to get omega minus in the q to zero limit is approximately equal to the square root of 2k a squared m plus m times q and this is uh, our uh, speed of sound so um, in the next video, I'm going to redo the problem, actually in the quantum limit. And surprisingly, we're gonna see that the solution is not more complicated than the classical limit. Well, I actually find that uh, the quantum solution actually easier than the classical solution. But in any case, uh, however you classify the solution easier or more complicated, the solution is actually gonna be uh, quite similar to what uh, we found here. And uh, the spectrum of the quantum phonons will turn out to be exactly equal to the spectrum of the classical phonons. So, um, which is uh, another sort of striking manifestation of uh, cl quantum to classical correspondence and actually a rather complicated system. In this case, this system models uh, a crystal.